two stories are about kids. Fifty years ago, fat kids were virtually unknown. Now, one in four American children is obese, and it's getting worse. They're heading for adult lives of heart disease, stroke, or diabetes. Somehow, our kids have become too inactive. Or they're eating too much, or both. Now, do you guys know why you're here today? Right, to eat lunch. Now, do you have to eat everything on your plate? No, right? You can eat whatever you want. Anything you don't want, you can leave it on your plate, okay? This classic experiment explores our most basic relationship with food. The judgment we have of the right amount to eat. There are five children between three and five years old. Their lunches are the right size for this age group, about 400 calories. They're told to just eat what they want. And as the meal ends, three trays still have food. But a couple are almost empty and they belong to the older kids. That's because young kids listen to their bodies telling them when to stop, whereas older kids and adults are controlled by outside influence. As kids get older, because we try to socialize them into eating when it's time to eat and finishing what's on their plate, they begin to really learn um, that there are other things in the world that can control their eating. The slices are going to be about twice the size that they were. Um, in yesterday's condition. Okay. The next day, the same five kids come for lunch. This time, their portions are doubled. Much more food than they need. And now, the split between younger and older is obvious. Two five-year-olds have cleaned their plate, just like you're supposed to. What children may be learning when we serve larger portion sizes and encourage them to finish those portion sizes is that that's the amount that's appropriate for them to eat. There's nothing wrong with finishing your food, so long as what was on your plate was the right amount. I would like a Happy Meal cheeseburger, quarter pounder with cheese, a medium fries, and a medium Coke. Okay, 1366. Thank you. Leanne Birch, who has been studying children and eating for 25 years, Years, that our view of appropriate portion sizes has been steadily going up. What you see here is a happy meal, which has about 630 calories in it. This is for a young child, probably nearly half of the energy that the child should have for a day. Large portions are regarded as appropriate for adults as well. The trend to supersizing. Size meal, which has about 1,830 calories, uh, would just about do it for me for the entire day uh, with my 2,000 calories. And yet, these are the kinds of portion sizes that are out there that are supposed to be consumed in a single meal. We're back in the lab for another experiment on kids' attitudes to food. We're going to turn one of these foods into forbidden fruit. In the beginning of this study, we basically are offering children a wheat cracker and a goldfish cracker, and we're offering them equal amounts because we want children to have the ability to have equal sort of access to both of these foods. First, they want to make sure the kids will at least eat goldfish. In fact, they all eat a bit of both, but not a lot of anything. But now the status of goldfish is about to be transformed. In the second part, we're actually going to change the rules so that they can still have as many wheat crackers as they want. The goldfish crackers are going to become off limits. When I ring the bell, you guys are going to be able to eat the goldfish crackers, okay? So no goldfish crackers until we ring the bell. For an agonizing five minutes, those delicious, desirable, fantastic goldfish are absolutely unobtainable. You know what me that means when we ring the bell? Okay. At last, it's goldfish time, and you don't have to be a psychologist to figure out what happens. The kids pig out. It's a forbidden fruit effect. He got a lot. Clearly, this isn't the way to change kids' eating habits. Paradoxically, restriction not only is not an effective way of promoting moderation, but seems to promote the behaviors that parents intend to avoid using that practice. Do you know what tummy that is? Empty. That's an empty tummy, all right. What kind of tummy is this? Um, You'd be full, right? 
How do you feel right now? In our next experiment, we're working with kids who have just had a meal. They shouldn't feel hungry. It's full. Okay. We've got pretzels, peanuts. Now Elizabeth has shown a large tray of snacks, chips, ice cream, cookies, popcorn, which she likes. And chocolate chip cookies. All right. Now I need to go next door for about 10 minutes to do some work. All right. I'm just going to leave. This is extra food that we have. If you don't want it, you know, you don't have to eat it. But if you want to, you can eat anything you want. And we also have this box of toys here. This is a pen here. It's a gel pen. So you can write on that. So I'm going to leave this box with you. And I'm also going to leave the tray with you. Elizabeth, once left alone, behaves in a way that might surprise you. She ignores the food. So far, at least Elizabeth is、um, not terribly interested in eating. Takes a while before bored with the toys. Finally, gets around to trying just some popcorn, favorite food. Now, now take a look at Morgan. He's left alone. He digs in. Here's the important point. Morgan comes from a home where access to these attractive sweet or salty snack foods is strictly controlled. Controlled, as Elizabeth is unrestricted. Parents who tended to use a fair amount of restrictive feeding practices, namely parents who were concerned about their kids consuming too many of these kinds of palatable foods, and who、um, restricted their kids' opportunities to eat those things, actually had the children who ate the most. If you came home and had any one of snack foods without asking your parents first, would they be upset? And、when you have the ice cream, can you have as much as you want, or does your mom dish out a certain amount for you? She dishes out a certain amount for me. And if you want more, does she let you have more? No, just one. Just one. Restriction actually tends to foster、um, consumption in the absence of hunger in children, and increased interest in the very foods that、uh, parents think children shouldn't be eating, and conversely, pressuring children to eat. Um, healthy foods uh, tends to turn them off with respect to to those foods.、Uh, so, what do you do instead? You know, I think as a parent, that's really the tough part.、Um, I think there there are a couple of things. One is、um, we need to help parents to understand what are reasonable portion sizes for children, so that parents have reasonable expectations about how much foods kids need to eat.、Uh, the other thing is we need to I think help parents. To appreciate how children learn to like foods that aren't sweet and that aren't salty, and the way that you do that is you have to, I think, be pretty patient as a parent.、Um, you know that kids initially reject a lot of new foods unless they're sweet or salty, and, and it's only with repeated presentations,、um, non-coercive presentations, that kids learn to eat a lot of those foods. Without that kind of perceptive parenting. Are too caught in two terrible traps. First, we say finish your food. Then we put too much food on the plate. Then we say that high-fat, high-calorie snack foods are forbidden, so kids want to binge on them. But it gets worse. Look at our next story.